everyone, and welcome to First Things First. Wait, go back. What? Wait. Go back. Let's start at 635. <laughs> Good morning, Steve. <laughs> Happy Friday. I've already been praying. She's I already released Wolf. my scripture and everything. That's the Hall of Famer, it's Chris Carter. I didn't know you were I'm there, Nick America. Wright. I was just saying, oh, hi. We were, were talking, we? and now you're in our conversation. Uh -huh. We love having you here. We've got three hours of programming for you. Chris Carter, Nick Wright, I'm Jenna Wolf. Lakers might be making life a little easier for LeBron. Ooh. Kyler Murray is looking to prove his doubters wrong. CC's going off about something, but Just we real quick, start. Before we start, that's yeah. a new record, and I think it's an unbreakable record. Uh, yes. It was 630 yeah, and you can't get oh, off script oh, oh, two seconds. That like, what? That I went off yeah, script? Yeah, that you went off script. Like, I mean, that'll, that is. Have replay you, it, Nick have Carter, because she doesn't know. Replay it. What you doing, Nick? Oh, hi, everybody. <laughs> have you met me? Fancy you being here. <laughs> Right, Let's do, do television. Right. We're going to start with Antonio Brown. And she's a pro. Here we go. The, of been all doing, of us. Been doing this the for a minute. The most professional. Uh, we start with Antonio Brown and his potential frigid landing spot, both realistically and figuratively speaking. Among the many teams vying for the disgruntled wide receiver services, the Buffalo Bills may actually be the front runner. Yesterday, a report came out that the Bills were, in fact, finalizing a trade for A.B. Well, that was swiftly met with an Instagram comment by Brown that just read fake news, as well as other prominent reports calling the deal unlikely. Keep in mind, in Buffalo, he'd be teaming up with a quarterback who struggled mightily in his rookie year in Josh Allen. And Josh Allen, as we know, is no Big Ben. All right, CC, I'll start with you. Would it make sense for the Bills to try and trade for Antonio Brown, considering what Antonio Brown wants and what the type of team is he'd play for? Yeah, well, from a financial standpoint, to be able to get one of the elite players at the price tag they're getting him at, and it's going to take some sweetener. It's going to take some type of sign-in bonus or guarantees. But most teams, they're not afraid of that. Where Buffalo is, if they're going to try to give Josh Allen a chance to have a pro career, this is something they're going to have to do. I looked at the wide receivers coming out in the college draft, and they got a high draft pick at number nine. Is there one guy right there at number nine that I think can change their offense? No. Can Antonio Brown? Absolutely. I mean, he has proven and the type of confidence that he gives a guy because he, the way he plays his game with A.B., and you have someone like Josh Allen, he can throw the ball right now to him sideways, get a lot of completions, which really helps out a young quarterback. And the other thing that Josh Allen does and does well is throw the ball down the field or ad-lib and throw the ball down the field, which A.B. being one of the best in the business as far as a deep threat. So, yes, this would be a great trade for the Buffalo Bills because, man, Josh Allen, it's on the board is he going to be a bust? Right, of course. Will he develop into a quarterback? And if you don't give him guys at an elite level to throw to, to throw to, the probability of that it goes way up. How how much does it affect w the level of production you would expect from Antonio Brown that when he demanded his trade from Pittsburgh, if he and his agents, he and Drew Rosenau sat, sat down and power ranked preferred destinations? I think it's fair to say. In all likelihood, Buffalo would have been 31st on the 31 team list, right? Like, or it's certainly in the bottom three or four spots it was a because joke. of. It was a be careful what you wish for. Right. You could end Jenna up in Buffalo. Jenna made the point the day, the day that this was brought yeah. up. Jenna said, "Okay, yeah, you might end up in Buffalo." And Jenna spent time in Buffalo. Apparently, hated it there. <laughs> no, no, I didn't hate it. <laughs> but it's no, just very cold. it's very cold. Yeah. You don't. I mean, the, this reminded me of Kelvin Benjamin. Remember, Kelvin? Man, give me any other quarterback other than Cam Newton, and look at what I'll become. Oh, I looked I looked it up this he's morning, He's been a Kelvin. couple different teams since then, right? Yeah, well, he had 20 he's with the Chiefs at the very end of the season. His time in Buffalo went for 23 catches last season before they cut him loose at near the end of the year. So what version of Antonio Brown do you think they would be getting? Would they be getting the best version, even close to the best version of Antonio Brown, if this is a place where, because he can say what he wants, he enjoys the spotlight, and you are going to football Siberia to a degree with the Buffalo Bills, and you are going to a place where the quarterback is, while he might have some of the measurables of Big Ben, is, is worlds away from Big Ben. I mean, he is not Big Ben, and, and it's, it's, the, it's the risk that you take. And one of my problems with A.B. is not that he demanded a trade, but how he went about it, how he really tore this organization down, Mike Tomlin. And he didn't have to tear Big Ben down. 
even though it might have been justified. So for me, when he meets with the Roonies, they give him the meeting, they grant him and say, you know something, we're going to try to trade you. He's made a number of mistakes, but he made a mistake on that day because him and his agent should have had a list of teams that he preferred to go to and let the Pittsburgh Steelers know, I won't go just anywhere. You can't just make these type of demands when you get to the end of that trade cycle. We knew they were going to trade him before the bonus was going to come due. So now with him, would he be um, happy in Buffalo? No, he wouldn't be happy there. But he should have made a list for the Pittsburgh Steelers. That would have been a better way as far as trying to go somewhere where he was going to report. As opposed to Instagramming yourself, Photoshopping yourself in a 49ers uniform and just throwing that out there. Where does this leave, Nick? Where does this leave the Pittsburgh Steelers at this point? What, what are their options if, if he says, I'm not going to play to a team? Doesn't it limit the teams that will deal with well, Pittsburgh? I think Antonio, the reason, I, I think he has been either intentionally or just unintentionally and just naively submarining his trade value with every Instagram post, with every interview. interview. He, and because of that, I think if, the, if in that meeting with Art Rooney, and it's a great point by C, if they had come to an agreement, listen, here's the half dozen teams I would most prefer. That's what I would like from you. What I will give you is I will zip it. I won't say another word. I there won't be another negative mark against me so you guys can get the most value. I think the Steelers, in talking to some of the people that cover the team in Pittsburgh yesterday, the feeling that I've been told is the Steelers think he's intentionally submarining his trade value. And with that feeling, and I think the reason this report, at least these talks started, even if this report was very premature, was all things being equal, I think the Steelers would prefer to send him somewhere he doesn't want to be. This is like the opposite of a Jimmy Garoppolo situation where Bill Belichick, he needed to get as good of a return as he could get, but also really liked the guy. The guy had done his job, wanted to see the guy succeed. I think the Steelers are saying, man, you got to be kidding me now. Like, so we had Le'Veon Bell. You know, hold us hostage to, in their eyes for a year, lost him, and now we're going to lose him in free agency. We kind of lost that battle of wills. If we then also send Antonio to one of his preferred destinations when he continues to act a fool, what does that say about us? So I don't think the Bills would have to make the best offer to get him. I think they would just have to make close to the best offer. But it looks like some of the more credible reporters are saying while they were in discussions, the Bills never made a firm offer that Pittsburgh wanted. And what you always say, CC, is that this Pittsburgh Steelers organization is not one that's going to be held hostage by a player. It's, it, it's a, a good organization. They have good people running it, and they're not going to let a player dictate what and how that's going to well, happen. Well, the optics that have come out there the last 24 months, it's time for the Pittsburgh front office to start acting like the Pittsburgh front office. Because the two-year thing, franchise and Levy and Bell, that's not the way normally the best franchise. And that's, the, that's not what the franchise tag is meant for. And last year, not only the Pittsburgh Steelers, but his football fans, we got robbed of one of the great young talents. Where he's only 27 years old and L. Bell is not playing football. So when you look at it from a global perspective, it'd be nice for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Because I rant and rave. I, I brag about how good these teams yeah. are. New York football giants, man, the last couple of years, I get criticized all the time for defending their own ownership, defending what they're trying to do. That's because these teams have done this for a long time. I mean, they are beyond one bad decision that would change their resume or change their reputation. When you are third generation, not only did I run the team, Mr. Rooney, not only did my dad don't run it well, but also my grandfather ran it well. And to me, that's the respect that they've earned. They haven't lost it over the last two years, but it's time for them to put their foot down. All right, we're going to take a break. Coming up, a huge trade that actually happened in the NFL. Yeah. What's, what's bigger, the trade you're getting ready to discuss or the font they put in there for okay, you? Okay, all right. <laughs> you want to know something? Hey, she don't have her bifocals. Oh, there they are. Stop, all oh. of you. We, it's Friday. Let's enjoy it. That is next on FS1. You can always check us out. Here we go. On the Fox Sports channel on Sirius XM. We'll be right back. Make a comment. Go ahead. Oh, I mean, oh, good oh, lord. Yeah. Right. I can, I can oh, see the see 2019 that. schedule. The NFL ain't even <laughs> <laughs> We'll get to a quarterback trade in a second, but first, we'll start in college basketball. Wisconsin, Khalil Iverson destroying the rim on the very first play against Iowa. Oh, on Wisconsin. Now, that's a Wisconsin highlight I can get behind. I like that. None of that Brad Davidson silliness. That's a yeah. good basketball play. Bucks and Pacers, Tony Snell dropping Bojan on his way up for the layup. Oh, he crossed him over, shook him down to his boots. Oh, where are you going, man? What's over there? Boyan Bogdanovich has been 
really good for them this year, particularly since Oladipo went down. Yes. Pacers still holding on to that three seed. Not a good game for them last night, but they're playing the best team in the NBA. Same game. Watch Giannis. Drive, hits the nice spin move before throwing it down. My God. Great fourth quarter by Giannis. The game was could be contested. I think they were up by 12. Man, Coach Bud called a timeout. Man, he ran four plays in a row to Giannis. 20 points. Good lead. night. Rap. More from the Bucks Pacers. Miles Turner trying to throw it down on Giannis. Not happening. This is going to be the closest MVP race in, I mean, maybe since Nash's second one. Uh, about 13 years ago. I, I don't know who the MVP is. To this day, we got 18, 16 games left. Giannis makes a case, then Harden plays. He makes a case. It's been the first time in a long time that we're going to look at defense as an aspect to build them even yep. up the board. All right, let's talk a little football now. Quarterback Case Keenum. Casey. My guy has hey, found Case. yet another landing spot. This time <laughs> on the East Coast with Washington for Keenum. This will be his fifth team. Since entering the league. Last offseason, he was a prize acquisition for the Broncos and John Elway. Yes, a surprise. He was. <laughs> now, maybe he wasn't a surprise. Now he'll head to Washington for a sixth round pick. See what you make of the deal. Man, you're talking about two teams that are desperate. Let's go with Case first. They've already made the trade for Joe Flacco. It'll be made official on the first day of the league year. So he knew he couldn't be a starter there. They were paying him starter money. They realized, like, okay, you're just a placeholder. You're not a franchise quarterback, which most people in the league, that's what, that's what they have um, as a scouting report on case. And the other side, Washington, Alex Smith, unfortunately, with the surgery, everything's going bad. They don't know if he's going to play in ever. 2019, 2020, or ever play football again. So they were desperate for a for a, a quarterback, for someone like Denver last year, a placeholder until they can get their franchise quarterback. And the deal for which they came to, they swapped some late picks. Um, Denver gives him a half million dollar signing bonus, decides I'm going to pay you half your salary right. for you to leave out the door. All right. So case, that's who, that's how bad they wanted to get rid of him. Washington's going to pay him 3.5. The Broncos are going to pay him 3.5. And the Washington Redskins have their starting quarterback. I love this move for Washington. Not because I think Case is a great player, but he's better than Colt McCoy. And unless Washington was going to try to get in the Josh Rosen sweepstakes that we don't even know if it's a real sweepstakes because we don't know if he's actually... And they'd be probably heavy competition. Absolutely. And you'd give up certainly much more than a sixth swapped with a seventh round pick. The draft compensation is almost negligible here. And this is basically... He's not going to play for us, so we want to get at least some of his salary off our books. So we'll pay half of it, as C mentioned, right. but you guys take the other half. Of it. Not but a big cap hit the way they structured it. Absolutely right. And so th they needed to do that because of how they had structured his original contract and then bringing in Flacco's high-dollar contract. I, For the Broncos' side of it, I got to tell you, if you ask me right now, make a bet. <coughs> Bless you. Excuse Who has a better year in 2019? Joe Flacco with the Denver Broncos or Case Keenum with Washington, my money would be on Case. Really? I think at this point in his career, Case can do more. I think at Washington last year, they were a surprisingly competitive team. They actually had a good defense. The offense obviously fell apart before the Alex Smith injury. Remember, right. they had their entire offensive line devastated by injuries, and they had a really good offensive line up until the midway point in the season. So for Washington, there's no risk involved in this. You hope that Alex Smith can come back in 2020 because they are paying him a ton of money. Right. That, that extension just kicks in this year. But I, I like this move a lot for Washington. And Denver, we'll see. We'll see if going out and getting Joe Flacco, who had been bottom of the league rated among starting quarterbacks over the last five season, seasons, work out, works out for him. But obviously, John Elway is a prototype. Flacco fits it. Case did not. And so that's the direction that they wanted to I'm go. I'm sure Elway knows what he's doing um, with that. <laughs> Sarcasm. <laughs> um, let's see. W w tell me what this does with Washington, the NFC East now. Does, in your eyes, does it make them a better team going into this season? Yeah, well, they were getting ready to get banished to the CFL if they didn't get a quarterback. I mean, does it make them better? No. This the Washington. The, no. Washington is rebuilding. I mean, it makes them a little better because Case, because Case is better than Colt McCoy, but are they a threat to make the playoffs? 
No. What would what would offensive? Who are we gonna throw to? Who's gonna run the ball? Their star running back last year, first round pick from LSU. He has a knee injury. We don't know what he's going to look like in his second year coming back from that knee injury. Wide receiver, who are they gonna throw to? They got a nice tight end. He gets hurt. Their offensive line, they have offensive line problems every year. So no, that's not they're the worst team in the NFC East. And you're talking about a very, very hard division. Philadelphia, Dallas, the New York football giants. This is the worst team in the division. Is it not? But so over the last five, four years, nine and nine wins, eight wins, seven wins, seven wins. And I would say every year without with some major problem, right? Last year it was a spate of injuries. The year before, I felt like there was the Kirk Cousins thing looming over him the entire time. Obviously, they need some pass catchers. The offensive line, I think, has the ability to be excellent, and we've seen that. They just lost three offensive linemen to the IR in a 10-day span last year. So I, Washington's been, to me, competitive based on their running game and their defense the last few years. The running game fell apart when the offensive line fell apart. Got, they liked guys, the kid from LSU. Like, I don't, in 2019, I don't think an ACL injury necessarily derails you. So, I maybe I'm a little more optimistic about their chances than you are. Like, I, I, yeah, I maybe would, when you do those hits to Washington on Friday and everything, <laughs> you're a little more familiar with the roster, but they have no chance of making the playoffs. When you are trying to rely on a team that it's hard pressed for them to score, you're trying to rely on, oh, they're not going to have injuries. That's all they've ever had on that offensive line. Year after year of injury after injury. And also, they miss Kirk Cousins, those 4,500 yards a year that he used to be able to, oh, man, is that good enough? they like to have that. Now, that was the most dependable part of their offense. All right, let's take a break. Coming up, talk some basketball. LeBron caught Michael Jordan, but can he catch Kareem? That's the discussion. Next on First Things First. Welterweight world champion Showtime, Sean Porter, defends his belt for the first time live in primetime tomorrow, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific only. On Fox. Let's go, Showtime. Be a champ. Time for us to go viral. Tom Brady took to Instagram to post the next car in his garage with Odell Beckham Jr. taking notice of the Aston Martin, commenting on Brady's picture, waiting for mine too. Sheesh. Brady took the opportunity to get the trade target to New England. He wrote back to Odell, come to Foxborough for a test drive. Oh. Look at this. Brady doing a little recruiting, see? No, this uh, is no recruiting, man. I was following it on the gram because I followed them. Them is my guys and everything. Yeah, yeah. No, no, this is what happened. Tom Brady put it on there. Uh -huh. Super Bowl MVP Edelman was like, yo, bro, where's my car? Uh -huh. Then OBJ got into it. Uh -huh. But Edelman was the one talking, and, and then, but we right. only, and we then only put OBJ in. And then Brady saw Edelman and OBJ juxtaposing against each other and said, one of I these guys out. I would rather play with. Like, come on, OBJ, come on over to Foxborough. You and I, you were. Back. I don't think Tom would rather play with OBJ than Edelman. On Sundays he would. Maybe Monday through Saturday it would be a different story. I'm just Man, say. him Sundays and Edelman got a bromance is really strong. <laughs> I don't believe OBJ. He's cute, but I don't believe he can break them up. I was just gonna say that is the best Tom Brady has looked in a very, very long time. Gina, he looks. Gina, Gina, Man, Tom right Brady, I can't remember since, you gonna tell me that since the combine shot? photos. He hadn't had a bad day. Well, I don't know. He looks. I am going to tell you that's good. photoshopped. Well, whoever Jim that guy was not before the head. How photoshopped I, I actually works. Did. You think he and Odell were sitting in front of Gillette on the Just, car? Right, it yeah. happened yesterday. Now it's time for the AT and T wake up call. <laughs> Quarter. She, he looks pretending. good. Quarterback Case Keenum is on the move again. Washington has reportedly acquired Case Keenum from Denver, and that means they are out as a potential landing spot for Josh Rosen. Something that was highly speculated. Nick, where do you see Rosen landing now? If he is traded, if I were Miami, I would absolutely try to go after him. See, where's Rosen from? What's the city's name? Uh, something with a beach something on the end of it. Something with a beach on the end of it. He likes nice weather. <laughs> he played in UCLA, so yeah. Miami. He's a former tennis player. Right. A lot of these reasons why a warm weather city in Miami. Now, the AFC East, not a warm weather division, but you got half those games in Miami. Also, speaking of the AFC East, I said it earlier, if the market really falls out for Josh Rosen and the Pats could get him for one of their second or third round picks. I think him getting a red shirt year behind Brady would work, but those two teams I would peg him to if he actually is on the market. If he's on the market, I'd love to see him go to New England. It's a perfect fit for him. If Josh McDaniel's going to be the coach when, once Belichick decides to give it up, which I don't believe will be anytime soon, right. he fits into their system perfectly. Except it's cold up there, bro. It is cold. Yeah. It is very cold in New England. <laughs> 
Uh, last night, the Thunder beat the Blazers in overtime behind a strong night from Paul George and Russell Westbrook. They scored 32 and 37 points, respectively. Nick, what did you make of the Thunder's win last night? It was an excellent game. If people didn't see it, I think there mm -hmm. were 16 lead changes back and forth. Nobody ever had a double-digit lead. Goes to overtime. Uh, Russ was excellent. Dame Lillard on the other side was very good as well. But Russ continues this. Since the All-Star break, he's been spectacular. All of a sudden, his shot looks not broken anymore. Now, it's small sample size, but that's the version of Russell Westbrook the Thunder need moving forward. What I thought about the game was the intensity. You don't see that kind of NBA intensity till you start coming down the stretch. I'm looking forward to the, the rest of the month of March and getting into the playoffs. But, man, you saw both teams playing like something was on the line. Great game last night in the NBA. Top two teams in the West play tonight, Warriors and Nuggets. Warriors lead the Nuggets by just a game right now. Golden State coming off their worst home loss under Steve Kerr. Kerr said the team owes the fans a strong finish in the final home stretch of the regular season. All right, CC, what do you expect to see from Golden State tonight against Denver? Um, I I expect them to turn it on, but I expect them to turn it on a couple of days yeah. ago. But typically after a game like that, after a bad interview or the exchange that they had, Steve Kerr, Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, and the boys, they get it together. So this is the best two teams in the West right now from a record standpoint. Typically, Golden State likes to be able to send the message. Haven't done that much this year. I believe they would do that tonight. And, C, you've been on throughout the last couple months. I think it's a good point. What happened to the Warriors' dominating home court advantage? They already have nine home losses this yes. year. This would be their first time getting to double-digit home losses in the Kerr era. So mm -hmm. that is that's something to watch. And this game matters for them. Like, you win this game, you're in great position for the one seed. You lose it, you're not. Go ahead. And Steve Kerr tried to give the team a message because he thought in this last year to make it special for the fans of Oracle, right. it's been less than special with nine home losses. Because even though they're just moving across the bay, it'll be a totally different crowd when you're in tech San Francisco as opposed to Oakland. On Wednesday, LeBron made history, securing fourth place on the NBA's all-time scoring list. He did it in a Lakers jersey. Hasn't exactly been the season LeBron anticipated when he joined the Lakers. Yes, he did pass Michael Jordan on his way up the prestigious list, but could he become the all-time leading scorer by passing Kobe, Carmelo, and Kareem as well? Nick, what do you think? you think LeBron passes Kareem at some point? So he's going to pass Kobe next year, and he'll pass Carl Malone a couple thousand points thereafter. It would be shocking if he doesn't get at least to number two. It would take a, a career-ending injury for LeBron to not get to at least number two. I would say passing Kareem is less of a sure thing now than it was going into the season. Because if you just did the math and say, okay, let's say LeBron's scoring goes down, but he averages just... 24 points per game for his Lakers tenure and plays just 90% of the games, he would pass Kareem before the contract's up. He's in a position now because of the injury that he's 6,076 points behind him. At 25 points per game, that's 243 games. You have three more 80-game seasons. Like, okay, if he stays healthy, even if he doesn't, because you can average 25, then 27, then 25, 23, over the course Somewhere of it, there. then he'll do it before the end of his Lakers contract, right at the end of his Lakers contract. But one more injury, see, and it doesn't have to be a season ender, one more month of missed games, and he would not do it unless he signs another contract, whether with the Lakers or someone else. If he gets hurt one more time in the next three years, he would need an extra year extended on the back end of his career. And I don't know if he thought this was going to be his last contract or his second to last contract. Do you think that's important, Tim, CC? Do you think that we, we talk about whether he's a scorer or a passer and the accolades and the accomplishments and all of it, do you think that the scoring title is important to him, the all-time? I don't think it's as important to him because on his way there, like, it's because it, to me what LeBron is about, it's about winning games. And if he can happen to do that by winning a lot of games, playing four championships, he would take it. But I don't believe it's a real goal for him. He couldn't believe he passed Michael Jordan to get the number four. So if that's true, then he wouldn't be able to think that he can get to Kareem. It's one of those kind of things that, man, it's, it, it's only it's less than 1% of the NBA superstars are going to be able to play that consistent for that type of length. 
based on Kareem, the type of athlete he was. Man, he was ahead of the curve as far as the, the, the technology, getting injured. Am I going to take my ankles, how to eat, how to train, yoga? Like, Kareem was way ahead of the curve. So, LeBron is a freak of nature. And he has incorporated all those things, the eating, the investing in his body, all those things you can do. But when you miss 18 to 20 games, it affects that ability. So, no, the most important thing to LeBron is winning another championship. It's not any other passing to anyone because it's not going to matter. If he doesn't win another championship in the pantheon of players, I don't believe he's going to go up or down um, with that being the best score. I don't believe that that those are just numbers right now. And I do not think Le LeBron has this this number circled as this is one of my career goals. I'm sure he'd like to get there. And I and I, I by the way, I think he will get there. I think he'll average more than 25 a game over the next couple years at least. And I don't think the one injury means he's now all of a sudden going to become an injury. It becomes player. harder if they add a young superstar. Yeah. If they add Anthony Davis because Anthony Davis should score 27 to 30 points. And the lowest scoring of his career, other than his rookie year, were those Miami years when he had the most uh, talent around him. But what I don't think LeBron would do is hang on an extra year just, just to go get this. Like, if he doesn't have it by the end of this late No, he'll contract, make up some other excuse. I just want to play. I mean, just because most guys at the end, like, we're not seeing their best, but if they want to play, like, man, this guy's been so good, he should continue to play. Uh, no, I, and I don't think that'd be an excuse. I think he, if he still wants to play, he Well, it's not it. an excuse just saying I want to play. Right, that's my point. I it, mean, people will always say LeBron because if they're not competing for championships, they will say he's only out there trying to compile stats. And I and I don't, but I don't feel that way about Dirk right now. Like I don't think Dirk's just because Dirk can catch Wilt, by the way, to move into the top six at the very end of the season. I think people look at Dirk and say it's, he's not doing it because he wants to move up the scoring list. He's doing it because he wants to keep playing. I don't think LeBron will hold on an extra year for this. Maybe he holds on an extra couple years at the end just because he wants to keep playing. Will or to he, play with his son. son anything him. like that. But I don't think, I think passing Jordan, it was clear, was very important to him, became important to him. I don't think passing Kareem was one of the things I've got to do it. I think he will do it, but I don't think it's something that he had circled I have to do in my career. All right, let's move on talk some Kyler Murray. It was announced yesterday that Kyler will be participating in his Oklahoma Pro Day on March 13th. He'll run the 40-yard dash. He'll go through passing drills. He will also be remeasured and weighed again, perhaps in response to the recent bad press. CC, does Kyler have anything else to prove at this point? Well, first tell me what, it, tell me what are his accolades. Tell me what he's done in pro football. Well, and nothing, then, none of these guys. Oh, okay. So he hasn't proved anything. So he's got everything to prove. Like, we don't know what kind of football player he's going to be in pro football. Like, are we just saying, oh, he's great because he won the Heisman Trophy? Because I can give you a list of a bunch, not a small handful, of a bunch of guys that won the Heisman Trophy, but in pro football, they were not good football players. So now, every time, because he decided at the Combine, when the NFL calls, man, when you got talent, it's time to show them that talent. So he's got everything to prove because he has done nothing as far as the NFL. There's a, there's a lot of things that go on in NFL locker rooms, but one of the one things that the veterans tell the young guys, I don't care what your resume was in college. Don't be mentioning it around here because it doesn't mean anything. What you did in the Big 12, man, it don't matter. What you did against Alabama, it don't matter. You ain't going to have your Heisman Trophy sitting up in your locker. So he's got a lot to prove. I believe that at the pro day, there's a couple things that people should see. I want to see, ultimately, I want to see his weight first. And you want to see what, how different is his weight now that he's gotten away from his training regiment when he was trying to add bulk, you know, how much did it fluctuate? And if I'm the team that's going to watch him, I have another private workout, and I'm going to measure him there. So I have the combine, I'll have his pro day, and I'll also have when I take him through a private workout. This is a job interview for one of the best jobs in the world. And if people wouldn't think that there would be some type of scrutiny, if there wouldn't be some type of parameters that are certain things that you need to do, there's certain color suits that you wear to a suit. Like you, I mean, wear to an interview. There's certain ways you wear your hair. There's certain uh, lack of jewelry that you're going to wear to a interview. This is a job interview. It's the most important job interview that he's going to ever have. So, yes, he does need to prove. I need to see him run to 40. I want to see. I want to see, does he have football speed or does he have football and track speed?
because that's very, very important to me. So those are the things that I really need to see are important. He throws the football accurate, so I'm not worried about that. So I'm not worried about his arm. I'm not worried about that. But his 40-yard dash, his weight, those are two things that are very, very important to we me. We were talking before the show because about the difference between whether or not you're going to work out at the combine, go through the drills, and the pro day being a totally different story. Like, you you had no problem with him not doing any of the combine stuff. I was worried for his case that it was going to come out the way it did, that the only thing that came out of the combine was negative interview stuff and not him reminding people, I'm a great thrower of the football. But you said it, you think it would have been unprecedented for a guy to not do stuff at the combine and then also say, there are a few drills at my pro day I'm not going to do. Like, the it would be, it would be a total departure from the norm for him to say, at my pro day, I'm only doing one, two, three instead of one through seven. He would drop on a lot of teams. Teams would take him off the board if he made that stance. It would be an idiotic stance by him and or his um, whoever's representing them. And I just, I, I'm getting sick and tired of people trying to make athletes like there's some shortcut. Like we're going to stop this process that we've been doing. We've been developing players, the combine, the pro day. It's a, it's, it, it's a, it's a process that's not perfect, but it's a process that's proven. And Kyler Murray, nor any other young prospect, is not good enough to skip each one of those stages. It becomes very, very important. It becomes very important, in shorts, that I can work out why the NFL is watching and I can show them my talent. And we shouldn't make that system, make those changes to the system for any one player Kyler, nor any other player that I've seen. And the top-rated quarterbacks, one of the reasons they don't always throw at the combine is because it's with guys you're not familiar with. It's right. in a setting you're unfamiliar with. The pro day is a normalized setting. You are on your campus. You are with receivers. your guys. You can set it up exactly the way you want to. So for a guy who nobody has questioned his accuracy, right? Nobody has questioned his throwing ability. It is important that he does well in that regard. Now, I know you're not concerned about it. I'm not concerned about that part of his game either. But after, there's questions about his height. We'll see if the weight stays there. There were questions even if they were unfair about the interview stuff. If he has an off day throwing the football, to go, to, that would compound his situation negatively. What he needs is what I think he's going to get, which is to remind everyone, this is how I won the Heisman Trophy. This and is the thing that's important. And people don't realize this because people don't expect greatness out of themselves. If you are going to be great, every time I show up, you're getting ready to see a great result. And for us to think that Kyler should, oh, you know something, that he should be afraid of this workout? No, he shouldn't. And we should have the same demands on him that we've had on the other players. He's got everything to prove because in our eyes, he's done nothing. And when he gets in that NFL locker room, that's the way NFL players are going to treat him. And we should mention, he is going to participate fully at the Pro Day, correct? He hasn't, no, he's he hasn't gonna picked, do he's going to do, do everything. He's going to do everything. All right, let's take a break. Coming up, the latest on Antonio Brown. That is ahead on First Things First. Here, First Things First, FS1 NBA insider, all-around fun guy, Chris Broussard joins well, the man. show. Good to see you. What up, Chris? Great to Great be to here have once you. again. Good conversation. Man, Enjoying good the week. week. Yes. All right, let's do it. Let's talk OKC, the Thunder. Last night, they double-handedly took down the Portland Trailblazers in overtime, double because Russ Westbrook and Paul George combined for 69 points. Right now, OKC Broussard is sitting in the third seed out west. Are you buying them as a threat in the Western Conference? I like OKC a lot. I think they're the third best team in the conference behind Golden State and Houston. I think Houston's the only real legitimate threat to the Warriors in the West. I think the thing about OKC, they can overwhelm you with their athleticism. You know, and they're mm -hmm. like Paul George, Russell Westbrook, Terrence Ferguson, even Jeremy Grant. That's They used to do that to uh, San Antonio when yes. they had KD. Mm -hmm. They were always a problem for the Spurs because of their length and athleticism. But look, they couldn't beat Golden State with KD, who as great as Paul George is playing, KD is better. And when Golden State didn't have KD. So mm -hmm. I can't see them beating them. Great year. Russ has really matured. He still obviously takes too many three-point shots, makes the bad decision here and there. But as far as facilitating, he's gotten much better. And guys like Steven Adams, Jeremy Grant, Dennis Schroeder, and Paul George are having career or near-career years because of it. But I, I just 
could not see them beating Golden State. But he, they might not. If you think Houston's the only legitimate threat to Golden State right now, that, that would could be a, beat them. You, you think Houston could beat Golden State? Possibly. Yeah, right. I, I would pick Golden State, but yeah, I think Houston so, could. So the point I'm making is right now, Golden State Houston would be the one four. Right. And so I tell me if I'm wrong, Oklahoma City could beat Houston. Like, Oklahoma City could make the NBA Finals without ever having to play Golden State. Right. Like, that's why, to me, that win last night was so important. You saw the playoff intensity. We talked about it earlier. Almost two dozen lead changes. Game tied over a dozen times. It was never a lead greater than eight points. Because what Oklahoma City does not want, if they lost, they'd be basically flip-flopped with Portland in the standings. They would be looking at Houston in round one. And mm -hmm. you stay at the three line, go, you, you avoid Golden State, assuming they stay at the one line. Like, there's a lot of machinations right, 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 there. Right. But I am so impressed with what Russ has done over the last nine games. Russ, from the game before the All-Star break to now, I don't know if it's sustainable, but what he's done is he went back to his MVP season shooting-wise. Like, show what Russ was the first almost 50 games of the year. The most important line are those percentages. So... 41% from the field and 24% from three while averaging 21 points first uh, 48 games of the year. Since then, the assists are down, but the scoring is way up thanks to the fact that he's went from horrific three-point shooter right. to decent, and that also elevated his regular field goal shoot shooting. If Russ can play near this level moving forward with the level Paul George is at, this is an incredibly dangerous team to, in my eyes. Also, Paul George, which is the one thing you've been saying. We almost wanted to throw out most improved player. How much does he help this team with their athleticism and their length and all of it? And because his dimensions. Six, seven, long arms. Um, not KD, but KD-like-ish. Right. A great on-ball defender, great help defender, great in steals. But the biggest thing that happened was Russ, to me, I don't believe this, this nine-game stretch is going to help them. It's going to help the team get through a stretch. Because for me, it gives Russ the confidence to think that he is that guy a couple years ago. And he's not. And when he plays that way, this team is not as good. The reason why this team has been a threat this year, because he has said in his mind, that guy, Paul George, is better than me. I'm going to defer to him. Now, last night, Paul George is one of nine from three-point range. He's been great shooting it from deep um, all year. So Russ picked up the slack. And in this last nine games, when you get into a series, Russ can't fall in love with the three. And there's no one here that on this uh, panel can say, ah, I know he won't do that in the playoffs. No, I, that, What's their record in those nine? In those nine? I think they've, I think they've, they're like four and six, I believe. In their, something like that. Four and in their six last in their ten. last ten. I yeah, think they're so four and five in those nine because it also right. coincided with Paul George because he, he went yeah. through an unbelievable stretch. He got dinged and wasn't playing as well. Yeah, he's got a bad yeah. shoulder injury that he's trying to rehab. He's trying to play through right. it right now in the telecast last night. They talked about the difficulty and he's trying to strengthen his rotator cuff, but he's had problems shooting and it was a, you could see last night the one and nine from deep. Here's the reason the stretch is encouraging to me. In a different way. I know Russ is going to continue to shoot threes, whether he's 25% or 38%. I no, no, none of us can sit here and say he won't fall in love with the three. He will. He has th this year, last year, he shoots way more threes than he should. The point is, it's one thing to be shooting six threes a game at 25%, and it's another thing if he just splits the difference between the first 48 games in the stretch. If he's shooting them at 33%, they don't kill you. They kill that's, you at 25%. That's probably more realistic. Right, right and so the, the problem is, how many is he going to shoot? Right. Like, you, you're sitting here doing it like it's a, oh, you know something, I got water right here. I'll pour a little bit of this in here. But with Russ, it's always the maximum amount. Like, we know that. When the stage gets bigger, he's going to shoot it. And what he had did in the first half of the basketball season, deferring to Paul George, that's what made this team get in the position. In that stretch, they have not looked good as a team, even though he personally has benefited. Yeah, I think they're better off, and this scoring is a little lower. Maybe 23, 24 a game, and he's getting the other guys involved. Look, I do agree with your point that if – if Houston could knock off Golden State, so that seeding is huge. Huge. Then, yeah, then it's wide open, and certainly I'd throw OKC but, in there and give them a chance. But until then, we all talk about how all of these teams in the top of the West compare themselves to, to Golden State. So if OKC is going to face or beat the Warriors, what do they have to do? I really don't think they can beat them, but, you know, again, their athleticism has to be huge. Russ does have to Russ be. Russ has to be You have to get the best of him in everything. Yes. Not – 
shooting too much, you know, let, letting George be the leading scorer, but yet still hot from three. That's what you have to get from Russ. What you got to get from Russ is better on the defensive end. Last night, Damian Lillard gave him 51, okay? And he is not a great defender going against Steph. So it is not the best matchup when you look at, man, team versus team. Steph can take advantage of who Russ is as a defender. Now, we talked about on the offensive end, when you get in those matchups, he's a better matchup against Houston and Chris Paul right. at this stage because they're not going to have Chris Paul on the ball and stuff as much. They're not going to have him run around those screens and stuff. Steph is a tough cover for them so they have to try to figure out some type of way how we're going to slow down Steph. so much of this discussion about who is and is not a threat in the west has to deal with <clears throat> what version of golden state are we actually going to get is like and that's why tonight's game against denver to me is so intriguing it's at oracle the one seed is on the line they're coming off a terrible loss if golden state shows up tonight reminds everybody yeah there's drama katie and draymond Kay katie and the coach boogies plus my but guess what we're still while the world's better than everyone else, then this is all probably, aside from Houston, a really silliness. But if Golden State tonight, in a big game at home against the team chasing them, doesn't show up, then I think we have to start saying, okay, how vulnerable are they? And in a series where Paul George can, he can't go eye to eye with KD, but he can go as close as almost anybody in basketball, what can they do? We know Oklahoma City has more depth. We know that Golden State's bench has been a killer for them all year. We know that Steven Adams has been a guy that's always irritated Draymond. Like, there are elements that if Golden State is unable to lock in, where Houston's not the only team that can beat them in my eyes. Now, if Golden State tonight reminds everybody, guys, this is, guess what? We're fine. Then it's Houston and everybody else is really competing just to lose to yeah, them. To me, tonight is a big game. It is a chance to send a message game, but... For Golden State, I think Broussard and I, we will speak for, man, we got much confidence in them that they can hit the switch. If they don't do it this Friday, they can do it next Friday, or it could be the first week of the playoffs. But come playoff time, Golden State will have their whole focus on Three people. Yeah, I think their biggest their biggest focus is staying healthy. Yeah, how do we get through? Obviously, yes. they want to get, mm -hmm. get it together a little bit, but stay healthy. And Kerr does have to make that tough decision. They're going to have to Boogie. figure this out with Boogie. And they brought in Bogut. Bogut, yes, Bogut sir. thing's interesting, right? Yeah. yeah, but you know, look, that's the only reason they did it, because they see, like yes. everybody else sees, a what the deal is defender. with Boogie. Yeah, yes. no question. And we talked about it. I think they might have been better off just bringing him off the bench from the beginning, trying to sell him on, look, the second unit is yours. You're going to get your 15 mm -hmm. points a game in that second and Draymond unit. We're going to run it through And Draymond you. plays better when Boogie's not out there. Right. And so then Draymond would get more minutes without him. So, But they but they can't go back in time. And then once you make him a starter, sending him to the bench – yeah. could be a, one of Kerr's tougher decisions right. in this tenure no as the head coach. It's one of the reasons why this weekend is because Golden State has OKC coming up as well. This weekend's really interesting. Yeah. Chris, stick around. Take a break. Coming up, talk LeBron James. Is he still the face of the NBA? That's next on First Things First. FS1 is your destination for the day's best sports shows. Tune in for the big personalities on the big stories. We get you started right here. On First Things First, you can catch it on Monday through Friday, only on FS1. Back here with Chris Broussard. We're going viral. Chad Johnson, Ocho Cinco, spent just one season with the Patriots, and he will be the first to tell you about his below-average numbers with the team. He recently left a $276 tip to indicate the amount of receiving yards he had in New England. H how do we know that? Because he literally wrote it wrote on it. the receipt. I only had 276 <laughs> yards of the Patriots, which is really horrible. Chad Johnson's a generous wow. dude, man. Chad sure Johnson's is. known to tweet out, I want to go to the movies, like I'll buy out the theater for whoever shows up and just buy a few hundred movie tickets for people. He, That's nice. Chad Johnson has a cool like post-career career, big into FIFA, playing video games with fans. And he always be giving away money, man. Yeah, he should have invited someone to interpret that playbook for him. Hey, man, what does this mean right here? <laughs> go up and run a dig route. When that guy runs a dig route, this guy's going to run a post. This sing. guy's got the shallow cross. And then maybe I'll have more than 276 <laughs> yards because I understand what they was doing. 276 He said, man, this, this is in Mandarin. They, <laughs> how am I going to do this? All right, let's talk Giannis <laughs> Broussard. Last night, Andre Decumbo oh. led the Bucks past the Pacers. He had some help from other players, though, but 
That's not important now. Before the game, Bucks head coach compared Giannis to NBA legend Tim Duncan, saying, quote, I think personality-wise and approach-wise, he is similar to Duncan, so humble, but wants to be great and wants the team to be great. High praise from Coach Bud, who spent 19 seasons in the Spurs organization. Chris, are you buying this comparison? I'm totally buying it. I think it's right on the money. I mean, obviously, their games are completely different, but the personality, you know, the lack of ego, but yet, you know, competitive drive. I mean, you see Giannis in the All-Star game competing Going. for four quarters, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? That, I mean, Tim Duncan was such a mellow personality. Everybody always used to think he doesn't have that killer instinct. No, he had the killer instinct. He was just a laid-back type of guy, and that's what I see with Giannis. There's no drama. Most of our teams, Golden State, you got Draymond, obviously LeBron, Kyrie. Mm -hmm. Most of our teams have a lot of drama, of the top teams. Not so with Giannis. I think he's gonna that tone's gonna be set throughout that organization, similar to how I said Steph has done it in Golden State. He's a, he wants to stay in the small town. He's talked about I'm not going to L.A. I'm not leaving Milwaukee. Obviously, Duncan did the same thing in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's right on the money. Personality-wise, I get all of it, but career arc, career trajectory, and we're talking face the league-wise. Year six, Giannis is year six, LeBron. Year six, LeBron, the team won 45 games the previous season. That year, they won 66. He won his first league MVP. Last year, Milwaukee Bucks won 44 games. They're on pace to win 62. And Giannis might very well win his first league MVP. Year six, but remember, LeBron, LeBron had gotten to the finals no, I understand. four. Two years prior. Right, he right. Had, it, it, So he was, LeBron came, Le, LeBron, came through a lot earlier. Absolutely. And LeBron by year two was worlds better than right. Giannis by. I, I get that part of it. Year six, LeBron, 28, 8, and 7. Year six, Giannis, 27, 13, and 6. And LeBron from... I would argue a few seasons prior to his sixth year, but certainly by his sixth year, the best, the universally accepted best player alive, and Giannis is working towards that. Maybe not universally accepted, but certainly some people arguing the best player alive. I know you have an MVP vote. I, I said earlier, I think this is going to be the closest MVP race since Nash is second. Like, him versus Harden is going to come down to the wire, and I think Giannis getting his team to 60 wins, either winning or coming in second in the MVP, that's how you become the face of the league. It is that level of high-level production and team success. And the other thing to see when it, about face of the league, who else is eligible? So, like, Harden's too polarizing almost. Like, too many people dislike the way Harden plays. Kevin Durant right now seems to me to be, he would need an image makeover almost. I think it's Giannis or the guy that you think it probably could be in Steph. Like, one of those two guys is going to be the next most forward-facing player in the league in my eyes. I think Steph, because he has their credentials, I believe he's also going to have the additional ring this year. Also, him and Clay, I, I expect them over the next several years to put up ungodly tight numbers. I mean, dude's got 10 years in a row shooting over 40% from three-point range. Like, he is the perfect, F, especially FKD. It's set up for him. If KD leaves. Yeah, if KD right. leaves right. and then he stays there, he's the face of that franchise because I, I like the comparison because that's what we have to do in sports. We have to try to take someone out of our past, give them someone with someone who is currently so that the fans can be like, yes, I identify. But we can't take for granted what Tim Duncan had when he got to San Antonio. He had an injured David Robinson coming back. He had Greg Popovich, potentially one of the greatest coaches in the NBA, stabilized as far as a franchise that, you know something, you know what we're getting ready to do? We're getting ready to start looking at international basketball players like no one's ever thought of and start developing them. We're going to put the perfect roster as far as defense, shooting, spacing. Also, you know what I'm going to do for you, Tim? Before people do that, I'm going to rest you. Right. Before so he had back. so many things in Tim Duncan, and Tim Duncan, we know, was a better player when he came. He came out of college, man, as the big fundamental. Yep. He had seven or eight post moves then that we knew he was going to be a great player. So, yeah, I like the fact there are some similarities, small market and all that, but I think the fact that Tim Duncan, he did have the fire. But Tim Duncan never once in his career had the desire to be the best player, recognized as the best player in the NBA. And I believe that Giannis, he wants to be a great player. And Giannis has bought into he should be one of the best players, if not the face of the NBA. And I believe that that might be a pressure that might be too big for a young person because he doesn't even know what he's asking for. 
We know what LeBron went through. If we say Kobe and Shaq were part of it, we know what they went through. So these th these days have been easy for Giannis. The most difficult thing Giannis had, he couldn't get in the Mexican restaurant last year. <laughs> but what happens when he faces some real difficulty, some real challenges? And real expectation. Because all he's done is exceed the given yeah. expectations any given year. And you're talking about a guy who wants to stay in Milwaukee, a guy who enjoys the small town aspect of what his career could be. Could you be the face of the league from a small town? Yeah, in this you could. Day LeBron and was in Cleveland. You, yes. you could easily. Um, OKC, if Russ mm -hmm. was a little different, he could be it, or KD. I, I like your point about Popovich. Remember, Budenholzer came out of that system, was there for 19 years, so I'm sure he's going to take a ton of that stuff mm -hmm. and apply it to Giannis. Here's my only problem. or I don't know that Giannis could be the face of the league. He could be the best player. Tim Duncan was arguably the best player, yep. but never was the face of the league. Number yep. one, we've never had an international player be the face of the league. Number two, uh, I don't – like all the guys that have been the face, from Dr. J to Magic Johnson to Michael Jordan to Kobe and Shaq to LeBron, they've all had that – swag about them, that cool factor that that was beyond playing. Even if it was their game, the flash in their game, you know, with magic, with the passes and all that stuff. Gian, if Giannis, I've said it before, if he grew up in America and had that American swag, he would maybe all, like, he would be the guy that's going to be the face of the league. But he's more of a laid-back guy, like a Tim Duncan. I don't know if he's colorful enough to be the face of the NBA. And I agree with you. You stole my thunder. If, if it's not going to be LeBron and KD leaves Golden State, I would nominate Steph because I think he'll go off and they're still going to be a contender. So two things. One is one of the other reasons Duncan was never the face of the league wasn't just his personality. It was his style. Duncan was shooting, you know, backward jump shots yep. in the All-Star game. You know, Duncan was the big fundamental, fundamental to a fault when it came to branding, right? He didn't care about any endorsements. He didn't care about any of that. Giannis's style is exhilarating. Giannis his style, is, of, play, his yes. style of play is one of the most uh, attractive in the entire yeah, league. I don't think it's as attractive as the guys we've seen. Because it's very, very unique. We've never seen anyone play like him. So, for me, it's not always exhilarating because, like, Wow, i never seen that. Man, that dude took one dribble from 30 <laughs> feet. So there's a lot of figuring out. I think they're aesthetically, and more kids are drawn. You have to grow the game of basketball. I don't believe Giannis is going to grow the game of basketball by the way he plays. Steph grew the game of basketball. LeBron grew the game of basketball. Iverson grew the game. Jordan grew the game. Kobe grew the game. Shaq, man, when Shaq slid on the floor and was looking side to side, Shaq, they changed how kids, the perception of the NBA, and I don't think that Giannis has a style. The style that I see, I don't think that that's a style like those other guys. But the other point you made, and you made it in the morning meeting, see, was the international aspect. Like, we've never had a non-American-born player be the face of the league. Yeah, we want the well, NBA to be an international game. But I don't believe we want an international face to represent the Well, NBA. so here's the, here's the aspect of that, though. We've only once ever or twice ever had an international player be good enough to be in the conversation. Akeem and Dirk, right? And Dirk did it in an odd time where even when Dirk won his MVP, I don't think many people thought he was the best no, player in no, the league. Like, no. he would have the best season. And Akeem... I don't even know, was Barkley the face of the league when Jordan was retired? Was Jordan still there the face really of the league? There really wasn't one. There no, wasn't was a, there one. Was was a law. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There was Shaq a law. was trying to become the face of the league and probably would have, but then Jordan came back. So right now we're in a league where Giannis, Embiid, Luka's coming. Embiid he, could. If, if they, because he's if got they the personality. With, yeah, he got the personality. Got, and so my point is, and I he think, played at Kansas. I mean, if that helps to some degree. I think the international thing is going to fall by the wayside at some point because we just have so many more. Drazen Petrovic was never going to be the face of the league, right? You never, you had guys that were excellent international players, but that was always the qualifier. They're excellent for an international player. We have now had Giannis Embiid. We've got multiple international guys. We're going to have an international rookie of the year. Might have an international MVP. You've got Joel Embiid, who had MVP buzz throughout the year, probably until this injury really was going to be in the top five. There, I think it's coming. It's possible that a few years from now, the three best players in the league yes. could be all international. Embiid, Giannis, and Luka. Right. And, and, Denver and fans if I had to nominate two that might become the face just because of their personalities, 
and and I would say probably Luca and MB because Giannis and Luca's because he's white. Let's be, I think that would work in his favor too, like like it did for Steve, Bird and like it did for Steve Nash. And by the way, Denver fans will be mad at us back to back segments. We leave him out of Western Conference contenders. They're like, what about Jokic? What about but Jokic? He's Nash. like he's like Giannis, just the laid back. You know what I mean? In terms of becoming Chris, famous. we'll see you a bit later on in the show. Take a break. Much more first things first after right, this. Nobody even mentioned Danny Ainge. What year was he the face? He's not an international player. He's not very good. Jenna, you've broken your Danny commitment Danny to yeah. not talk it about Danny Ainge. 87 maybe was the first. Is he a favorite player or something? Yeah. Tomorrow, the Big East goes back to back on Fox. First up, number 23, Villanova taking on Seton Hall. Then Marcus Howard leading number 16, Marquette, against Georgetown. It's a Big East doubleheader. It all tips off tomorrow. 11.30 Eastern on Fox and also the Fox Sports app. Nova could use a few wins going into the Big East tournament. Come on, Jay Wright. Let's get it together, man. Talk some LeBron James in a second. But first, starting in college basketball, Wisconsin, Khalil Iverson destroys the rim on the very first play right, against Iowa. First of all, that is a great basketball name, Khalil Iverson. Second of all, this is an excellent highlight for the University of Wisconsin. A university not known for a lot of high-flying highlights, but Khalil Iverson gets the game going right 12 seconds in. Give me that. Oh, no, they get high at Wisconsin, but then it's not, Bucks and Pacers, not on the court. Giannis, the nice spin move before putting it down. Look at Giannis. Look at the ball handling from the big man. And then once he gets to that spot on the court, there is nothing you can do. Man, Coach Bud has done tremendous things for his game, too. Yep. Hard work. But Coach Bud's help. He might watch. be coach of the year. Your guy in Brooklyn's got a chance. Sorry, Jenna. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Russell Westbrook, watch the spin move off Damian, Damian Lillard. This was a nice sequence right here. D. Lillard got it back, went baseline, and yoked on him right afterwards. So it was a nice battle lap. Russ had a few nice J's at the end. Russ and Damian were doing a bit of a your turn, my turn last night. Neither one was expended. Yeah, it's not in the highlights, but Damian dropped 51 on Yep. All right, moving on to Antonio Brown. It was reported that the Buffalo Bills were close to acquiring the wide receiver, but that is no longer the case. Their general manager has come out and said that Buffalo is officially out on acquiring Antonio Brown, refusing to go to the Bills. And with the Bills out, the market is reportedly bleak for Antonio Brown. Nick, has A.B. killed his trade value at this point? I don't think he's killed it, but he certainly, whether Made intentionally it. or unintentionally, and if it's unintentional, then he just doesn't know what he's doing. He has seriously dampened it. How could he not have? If he could have handled this one way, which was, do one interview, explain why you don't want to be there, get lay out the very specific and I think reasonable issues with Big Ben, apologize if if you have it in you for or acknowledge you didn't handle the, the final week game. this season the best, and just say, listen, I think it's best for they want to move forward with Big Ben. I think the Kevin Colbert comments would have bolstered his case that maybe there is more of a systemic issue there than we had previously seen, and then zip it. And let your play speak for yourself. Zip it. All those other things. You gave him all them speaking roles. Then all of a sudden you get <laughs> well, ready to tell I the said, guy to it, be quiet. I said do it in one interview. Do one. This is this is what happened. Have a plan. Because I think people would want to know what happened that last week. What about season. a list of teams? Why? Would you have, if you're Antonio Brown, do you give a list of teams where you'd want to go the way, I and don't know, publicly. Kyrie Irving did? Well, listen, not publicly, but the I The ones did. who are smart do, Jim. Yeah, two that I don't think he would have. I, don't I mean, you're torching one team. That means there's 31 other teams. There's some bad franchises. I would prefer to let the organization know, don't put them on a list. So right. there's so many things he did wrong. And to think that, oh, he's going to have one time, one press conference, and he's going to handle that. No, he's not going to handle it the right way. He's messed up this the whole way. All right, from the time he didn't show up the last week of the season, because if he wanted to get traded, the best thing to do was to show up, be there the last game, and then after that, you saying, oh, he should have told everyone about his relationship with Ben. No, he shouldn't. That wasn't nobody's business. That wasn't nobody's business. What? He should have never talked about that because now as an organization, you don't have to worry about him throwing a young quarterback under the bus because he threw a Hall of Famer under the bus. So will he throw a young quarterback under the bus? Yes. He shouldn't have said nothing about that. He should have said, I ain't got no problem with Ben. Forget what people were thinking. That would have been the best thing for him. I'm cool with the organization. I'm cool with the quarterback. I just think it's time to move on. These are the teams I prefer to move on to. And, if you, and, and, and I hope, because if you trade me to someone off this list, I won't show up. 
which that's what happened earlier in this week to Buffalo. The reason that I think he had to acknowledge the Big Ben stuff is it was out there so well reported by so many people. And if you don't have a problem with Big Ben, then why do you not want to be there? It's a good team. You, you don't have numbers. to explain that. You're, I'm demanding a trade. Kyrie Irving, I'm demanding a trade. You don't have to. Insist. This is the thing. You know how many things, Nick, we know about these guys that we don't report, we don't talk about? Sure. Why did he have to talk about it? Well, because it was, at that point, I think it would have been thought of disingenuous. Like, you're demanding a trade. Everyone is saying that you have a problem with Big Ben. That had been out there, and you're saying it's not there. But regardless Sports is about disingenuous. No one's telling the truth. No one wants to hear the truth. When a guy tells the truth, you know what we do? We criticize him. That's the KD thing. When, we, when they tell the truth, we criticize them. So you're best up there and tell, tell the best lie. Because if I'm happy, I'm going to stay in Pittsburgh. To say I don't have a problem, we know we have a problem because you're retrusting a, cra a trade. But there's no need to put all that other information out there because it does not help you. So now that Buffalo's off the table, let's talk about what other possibilities there are for Antonio Brown. Where would he fit? Where do you think he wants to go? Where does that leave the Steelers now? The, the team that he initially pegged himself with, the San, the San Francisco 49ers, to me, that's always made sense. They have a ton of money. They've got their own draft picks. They, they need a wide receiver desperately. They have this big investment in Jimmy Garoppolo. The coach seemingly there, because of the length of his contract and the GM's length of their contract, they have full authority for all those reasons that one makes the most sense or at least as much sense as anywhere else it now, only makes sense on paper san francisco from the beginning first day of the combine they talked to the people in charge there have any interest in antonio brown no so on paper that's the only place it makes sense they just hired wes wilker as their wide receiver coach do you think they're going to put a guy like antonio with wes wilker's first time being a full receiver you think that they, so from an organizational standpoint like, I don't like to make suggestions when the organization has totally come against it. Like, I, 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 I move that off the board. But how does that fit with what you were saying about it's all sports is about lying? Like, the, the organizations can say one thing publicly because they don't, want, they don't want it out there that they're after a player if they don't get it. Nick, I said it's about deception from the player, okay? When you're an organization and you're at the NFL Combine, and they ask you, do you have an interest in Antonio? And the organization goes out of his way after Antonio has tweeted and Instagram pictures of him in your uniform after the greatest football player in my eyes and some Jerry Rice had photoshopped and said they should have him on the team. You know what John Lynch and them said? We run in the team and we don't want that guy. So for me, it doesn't make sense. Me, when we first started, AV, what's a good spot for him? San Francisco. Then I heard what San Francisco was saying. So I stopped talking about them because they're not trying to deceive well, if, someone. If, if they're being honest about a total lack of interest, then the other team that I think has shown more public interest and does not have the stability at the quarterback, they have the coach in place, is Oakland. Oakland, Oakland has the draft picks. They, they have the need. Like maybe just across the bay in Oakland is a team that if we're going to take their interest seriously, it makes sense. They, to me, have question marks at quarterback, but maybe all the teams going after Antonio Brown have question marks at quarterback. Let's talk to someone who knows a little something about what's going on in the NFL. Coming up, three-time Pro Bowler, Super Bowl 52 oh, wow. champ Michael Bennett joins the show next. Now joined by three-time Pro Bowler and Super Bowl 52 champion, Michael Bennett is here. Hey, Michael. Good it's good you. to have good you. you. Thank you, thank you. Welcome, bro. Welcome, man. Good yeah. seeing you. Good seeing you, too. We haven't had anyone very, very laid back to sort of bring it. We're, we're, ve we're very high energy here, so it's nice to have someone that calms us down. <laughs> y'all high energy? We got to Try to be. Yeah, y'all drinking a lot of coffee over here. Uh, we got bulletproof to. coffee. One, two, three, four, five cups combined. None of them are yours. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about Kyler Murray. Michael, it was announced yesterday that Kyler will be participating in his Oklahoma Pro Day on March 13th. He will run the 40-yard dash. He will go through passing drills. He will also be remeasured, and he will be weighed again, perhaps all in response to the recent bad press he's been receiving. Michael, what do you think? Kyler Murray, do you think he can succeed in the NFL with what you've read, seen, and heard so far? I think he's going to be extraordinary in the NFL. First question is we should be asking I would not be choosing the NFL over Major League Baseball at any point. $333 million deal by Bryce Harper? I mean... Well, that's I if you're going to be a star. There was, I mean, there's I probably a better probability based on people scouting that him being 
typically a marginal major leaguer compared to being a starting quarterback. Yeah. Those economics change a little bit. But, yes, Bryce Harper, that's some, <laughs> that's some for real money. Yeah, but I think he's going to be good in the NFL. I think you've seen over the time that he has the, a great arm and he's able to lead that offense. He's done great numbers over there in Oklahoma, and I think he's going to have a lot of success. Uh, also, without talking to you, I think that based on you being drafted and – Oh, undrafted. 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 And then your brother, also his draft process, that you just – you're you're about a chance. You went to Seattle where they just took guys no matter what draft and just give them an opportunity. So you're probably about, man, if this guy gets the right opportunity, gets to the right team, you believe he can be a superstar in this league. Yeah, I believe anybody could be a superstar if they put the work in. And I think this guy's done it at the college level. He's a Heisman champion. I mean, he didn't play good against um, Bama. Bama. But at the same time, he's still a great quarterback. I think he has the opportunity if he gets in the right system. I think he's fast enough. I think he has the arm. And I think he also has the willpower. And he's just a great competitor. And I think that's the number one thing you look at a quarterback. Will he compete? And I think for sure this guy's going to compete at every time and every level. There's one legitimate knock on him. He'd be the shortest quarterback in the NFL, the shortest quarterback ever drafted under the current process, but you won a Super Bowl with the shortest quarterback in the NFL and Russell Wilson. How, how His height doesn't seem to scare you at all, and you're a guy that makes your living going after quarterbacks no matter the size. How? Why is the height seemingly not a concern for you? I think the height makes it harder for you as a defender when you rush in the quarterback because you can't really see where he is, and he has the ability to have that running mode. He runs and he can see. I think Russell Wilson has a great, does a great job of being able to get out the pocket and find ways to get it, throw the ball out, and you can't really sack him because Russell just has that has that ability, and I think he has that ability too. Look at him juking guys and does a lot of great things with the ball. So. I don't know. I just feel like he still could be successful. I, I think a lot of people are doubting him because he's not tall, but there's a lot of tall, tall quarterbacks like Paxton that went to the Broncos, and he was 6'7", and he didn't turn out very, very well. So I think this guy has a he's, – he's a competitor. That's the thing I look for in a quarterback. Will he compete and will he lead his team? And I think he's going to do that. And so everybody that gets him, I think he's going to be that guy. So you mentioned two things. Will he compete and will he lead his team? The other so-called knock on him, if you will, this week was, was questioning his leadership and whether he could be a good leader, a good locker room rah-rah guy the way Russell is uh, do, do you do you see that in him I mean can you get that from him his interviews haven't been great but is that always the most important thing you're looking for I mean, in a quarterback I think it's hard to interview at the combine because everybody's it's the first time in your life for him where everybody's trying to find what's wrong with him what can he do and what what is, what is he what's what's your secrets and I think mm -hmm. over time if you look in those games when the game was on the line he always stepped up he was always cheering his guys on yeah this guy slapping guys on the butt just like hey let's go let's go in the game when he was down he got hit he came back in the game he's mm -hmm. playing as hard as he can so there a, there's, those are the qualities that you look for in the quarterback. Would he play hurt? Would he, would he compete? And I think that's the things that I see for him personally. How much of, and obviously you're a defensive player, but how much of, in your opinion, analyzing the game for a successful quarterback is what he can do physically and mentally as a football player on the field and what he does leading up to the game, what he does with the teammates? Because as great of a thrower as Russell is, as tough as he is, one of his, I think, best attributes is stuff he does during the week. They get the presence he has about him. At least that's everything I've read. How, how do you – what's the equation in your mind about what makes a great quarterback in this league? I think it's about his work ethic, and I think this guy has proven that he's a great work has a great work ethic. If you see his success on the field, you don't put the put up these type of numbers if you're not studying. You don't put up those type of numbers, whether it's rushing, whether it's throwing. So obviously, what is his work ethic? Or he's going to lead his teammates, and does he have fun? And obviously, in college, he was a great teammate. You can see all his guys coming to his defense, his coaches. I mean, if he was a bad guy, I think the coaches would have came out and said it. I mean, even when he had his his past, when it came up about what he did when he was a young kid, he came back and he tweeted about. It. He talked about it, and he moved on from it. And I think those are the characteristics of a great leadership, and I think he's going to be a great leader. And I just hope guys just give him the opportunity to, to succeed. Matt, you played with a couple of quarterbacks uh, this season, one being Carson Wentz, the other one being Nick Foles. It's well reported Philadelphia is going to allow Nick to be able to experience free agency. But there's something that happened. Not only you talked about the injuries, you guys started getting healthy. Yeah, yeah. But Nick Foles, when Nick Foles is in the locker room as a starter, there's something happened. And it's more than just injuries. What are some of the intangibles that you saw in Nick Foles? Because you've played with some good quarterbacks, Super Bowl winning quarterbacks. But what are the things that Nick Foles that add to Philadelphia? Because you guys were one of the most dangerous teams once it became playoff time. I think Philip. I mean, uh, Nick was just so calm. I think he's just really calm. I think that's the thing that made him 
You know, everybody, when you look at Nick and you look in his eyes, you know there's never going to be a moment where it seems too big for him. And I think even in the tough games, even at that last game when we were on the line against Chicago and we were like, dang, it's 10 seconds left in the game. We was like, we know we're going to win because we know Nick is going to be calm in the pocket. He's going to make that throw. And so for Nick, he always plays big and big moments. And I think that's why we have so much respect for him. And in the locker room, he's just cool, calm, and collective. I call him cool Nick. And <laughs> other people call him other things. In yeah, 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 but yeah, at this yeah, time, we're just going to keep it PG. You guys tweeted about that this yeah, week, some of your teammates. Yeah, but at the same time, Nick is always cool in the locker room. He's always uh, playing around with the guys, playing games, whatever, where the shooting pool, you know, playing ping pong. He's just a cool guy and then when you have a quarterback who's you know just down to earth because a lot of times teams make it where quarterbacks are just on their own and they're studying all doing mm -hmm. all these things on their own but it always felt like Nick and Russell were always a part of the team and whether whatever we were doing so I think guys buy into that and when you have an organization that allows the quarterback to be a part of the team and every single thing I think it, it just builds a, a great camaraderie. How was that different from Carson Wentz's approach? I don't think so I think Carson did the same thing I think Carson was battling injuries people forget that Carson towards ACL in December and he came back as fast as any quarterback has ever came back from knee injury he played and I think there's just those little small nuances that he didn't get a chance to do in the preseason mm -hmm. and he didn't get into you know the shape that he probably could be if he was fully healthy and I think everybody's forgetting how great Carson is and I think Carson was could have been the MVP the year before you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying so I think Carson was just a little bit injured and I think this year he's going to be a better quarterback because he's going to have time to you know get over his injuries and I think when you play injured and you end up getting more injured. And I think for him, he just kept getting little nicks and bruises, whether it was his back, whether it was his ankles, other things that were keeping him from having a success that he needed to have. And I think we were lucky to have a quarterback like Nick right behind and, and mm -hmm. to come into the game. Most teams don't even have the, a, first, a starting quarterback. Hey, before we go to break quickly, what was their relationship like? There were some things towards the end of the season questioning Carson Wentz's attitude towards Nick Foles being in there and whether he was a great locker room guy. Some of your guys came to their, his defense. What was their relationship? I said, like, their relationship was good. They lockers were right next to each other. They were trading books all the time. Nick wrote a book. And, so, and they were having a good trading time. Books. And I'm Nick like, wrote a book. I feel like, I feel like same kind of stuff was going on book. between I, you and Fletcher Cox. Yeah, we were just, it was just going around. I think the media always, they want to make a story, so they make a story. And yep. when everybody starts to hear, the story people start to believe it but I always felt that Carson was behind Nick he didn't go in and was like not not supporting yeah. him when he came to the sideline he would give him guidance hey man did you see this did you see that and the same way Nick was when Carson came back Nick didn't have his head down most guys would have been like oh man but at the same right. time Nick was like when my opportunity comes to get back in the game I'm going to be a star and when he got his opportunity he was a star so he played himself into these moments right now we stay with us one more segment no not for free awesome <laughs> no, that's right. spoken like any true Chris Carter friend Coming up, is Antonio Brown to blame for the mess in Pittsburgh? He is going to stay charity, around. CC's yeah. going to call the Red Cross. I ain't here for charity. I mean, I help. I'm like Trick Daddy. I love the kids, but it cost 20000 to get me there. Back here with Super Bowl champ Michael Bennett. Uh, Michael, it was reported that the Bills were close to acquiring Antonio Brown, but that is no longer the case. Their GM has come out and said that Buffalo is officially out on acquiring the star wide out. And with the Bills out, the market is reportedly bleak for him. AB demanded a trade after the season, citing issues with Ben Roethlisberger. Michael, what do you make of how the situation played out between the Steelers and Antonio Brown? First of all, I think the Bills were about to trade for him, and they were doing... We're fishing to see how the fans will accept it and how other people accept it, and it probably came back negative. And, and how AB would accept yeah, it, right? Yeah, so now they they are like, okay, let's backtrack on that. Because okay. it doesn't, doesn't make sense for a guy just to come out and just make this thing up about him being traded there. I think people just started to hear about it. But I think the situation is... I think they need to break up. I think him and Ben are just not, they're just not, they're not vibing anymore. They had a great vibe before, but if they're mm -hmm. going to keep fighting, that's just, just going to break the team up. And I think it's important for Antonio for his mental health to be able to be somewhere else and be just away from that situation. Also for the organization, I think sometimes things run their course. And I think this is a moment where it's run its course and he's, he's always going to be a great stealer. But at this point, it seems like he doesn't want to be there. And I think it's better for the organization and I think it's better for him to move on. We in the media talk about the catch-all word distraction a yeah. lot like and that can mean a bunch of different things yeah but discord within the team how much does it really affect you guys on Sundays when you play because the Steelers have the Le'Veon Bell stop and start is he going to yeah. be or is he not the AB Big Ben deteriorating relationship you hadn't been in a situation like that but there was some discord in Seattle the year after the Super Bowl loss so not they the Super say Bowl. okay is that not? I don't know. It's always there, it's always distractions on teams. I think things are always happening. It's yeah, about someone's contract yeah, is always up. Yeah. Someone's not playing as well. Yeah. Someone's always hurt. 
someone's always – things are just evolving all the time, and I think teams, the great teams are able to get past those things, and I think – Players seem to try to get into other players' businesses. Like, well, why is this guy? I wouldn't do this when it's my contract time. And everybody always says that to it's their contract time. And when it's their contract time, they're looking back like, oh, I see why he was acting like that. And I, I think in this situation, I don't know if Antonio is a distraction. I think the things that people are calling distraction now are the reasons why we love him. We love him because he's flashy on the field. We love him because of what he does on Twitter and Instagram. So that's why he is who he is. The fans built him up that way, and they loved who he is. And all of a sudden now, people aren't in love with the way he is because now he's saying, I don't want to be there anymore. And people and fans just can't Fickle. find to figure out why he doesn't want to be a stealer anymore. And I think him and Big Ben, they just don't agree anymore. And sometimes you get to that point where relationships need to have a divorce. And I think this is the time for the children and the rest of the family, for mom and dad to just move on. And I think it's important that we they both find a solution for this. Michael, how often does something like that happen where a quarterback and the wide receiver, they're not on the same page to the point where it's going to be one or the other. One guy's going to have to go. I mean, I, I feel, you can't tell me that everyone gets along on, on a team the no, entire season. I think not everybody gets along, but I think there's a mutual respect for each other. And, I and think, that wasn't there there? I think this respect is gone. I think the respect for between these two and the respect between the organization, the respect between the coaches and his teammates, it has diminished. And I think once you lose the respect of each other, I think it's time to move on. And I think in this situation, this is how, how it feels. When you, when you hear about it in the media and you hear things that are happening around, I think at this point, they just need to move on. I think it's like... But football is the only time where you have to depend on somebody to get you the ball. Like LeBron James doesn't have to depend on getting the ball because he always has the ball in his hand. And Antonio Brown has to depend on Ben giving the ball, even though Ben has made him one of the most targeted receivers outside of DeAndre Hopkins. But at the same time, you know, he, he wants to have the ball more or he wants to be the star of the team. I don't know what it is, but this time I think it's better for A.B. to move on. I think A.B., the respect thing is real. But the respect thing I don't know if fans understand is because they respected his game. They respect him as a player. He's one of the highest paid. He had one of the highest targets as a player. He's got six straight years with a hundred catches. But you want that mutual respect, the way you respect. You want you want the same respect the way they respect Russell. Respect me the same way. Yeah. And when you start to not see that in the team, and when you start to give away the family secrets, you start to tell people things about your father or mother that people outside the family don't know. And that's what Ben Roethlisberger did when he threw that interception. On the goal line, ball intercepted by a defensive lineman, he said that A.B. ran the wrong route. He might have ran the wrong route, but we don't expect a family member when we go after the game to be able to tell someone what we did wrong because what we're going to do is tell a version of the truth so that people don't know and we stay on the same page. And once you breach that type of trust, and that's the type of trust you had in Seattle. That's why you win Super Bowls and go to Super Bowls. That's what I felt like was the the the, the last straw there. Yeah, the straw that broke the camel's back. I think he felt that, you know, they didn't have that. And I think he could have just pointed out Ben whenever he makes a mistake or he throws the ball, doesn't throw the ball where it needs to be. And I think once Big Ben did that, it was just kind of just a trickle effect. Everything just started to go downhill. And I think at this point, I think it's important that, you know, for the season and for the fans and just for his own sanity that he just moves on and finds a, a team and organization that he fits in well. I think the Raiders are a good organization for him, maybe the 49 or somewhere where he could get the ball and he could just, you know, move on and find a better situation for himself. Question for you. D does what, the, the way this was handled by Antonio Brown, are there players who would say, I don't want a guy like that in my locker room like do, do players are players swayed in any way shape or form by, by the way the series of events sort of played out with AB I think there's a sense of respect for AB I think he's like people are like well most guys wouldn't have the have it to want to be to do the way he did say hey I want out and force his way out a lot of guys will continuously become a problem and just you know won't have the courage to go to the organization that they want to be find a way out and I think people want Antonio Brown because they know how hard he works if you watch his Instagram or you watch the thing that he's doing he's in the sand he's always working out he's one of the few guys in NFL that has a full staff with us uh, a trainer mm -hmm. a chef this guy's about working out this guy's about competing this guy's about playing at a high level every single week and if you watch him 
him in and out every single week, you see that he's out there playing. So I think guys want a guy like that who's going to push him when it comes to working out, push them when it comes to making big plays, and a guy who's not going to let them go down. So Antonio Brown's not going to be on the Steelers next year. We don't know where he's going to be. But those other guys in the locker room, for the most part, are still going to be there. You mentioned earlier in an analogy, better for the kids in the family, for the parents to get a divorce. The GM of the Steelers came out a week ago and said, Big Ben's, it's Big Ben and 52 kids. If you were on the Steelers and you were, you read, your general manager said that you were one of 52 children on the team, how would that land with 10-year veteran Michael Bennett? I mean, for me, I would never want another man to uh, call me a child or, or anything like that. So for me, it would be a it'd be an issue, I would go have a conversation with the GM yes. and make sure he uses his words properly when it comes to, you know... You would let him <laughs> know that you heard what he said yeah. and it was disrespectful and he would change that. But it wouldn't be in a negative way because the players, like him, understand. That coach, that general manager, that owner, I work for them. And i much rather work for them because it's going to be more productive than trying to work against them. So there's only a few people, though, that are going upstairs, though. Yeah. So y'all y'all might not like it, but you know what guys do? They go about doing their job just like y'all do take when it. stuff you don't like, you go about doing your job because you know something? That check and trying to take care of my family is far more important than me sticking my neck on the line for something that I don't know what the results but, might but be. But you would go upstairs and talk to them. I mean, obviously, you got to have that relationship when the GM and the players can have that relationship when things are said to come up and talk. Obviously, they don't mm -hmm. have a great relationship because you see the dysfunction when yes. it happens with something negative is said. When you have a great relationship with the coach and the GM, you can say, hey, I feel like you said this and this is how, how it touched me. Or, and it's like, and then you talk and you move on and the, things change. But at this time, it seems like there's so much dysfunction that things are, they just can't be fixed. And I think at this point, like I said, you know, it, this is Big Ben's team and it has been for a long period of time. He's outlived a lot of players. Heinz Ward, <laughs> Willie Parker, you know, Jerome Bettis, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, Ryan James Clark, Harris, Ryan going. Clark, uh, Troy Palomalu, you know. Add a new uh, one to the list. It's, and now it's Antonio, Antonio Brown. And so that's how things go sometimes. Michael, thanks for hanging with us this Great morning. Job, appreciate really you. Really appreciate you getting up. Man, invite me to life. Got you, man. Let's do that. All the best to you this season. Thank you for listening to the First Things First podcast. Remember, leave us a review and tell us what you think. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts and catch us on FS1 Monday through Friday, 6:30 a.m. Eastern. For Chris Carter and Nick Wright, I'm Jenna Wolf. So long, everybody.